Hi. We've had over 500 breakthrough projects come our way at Thrive in the past three years, both technological and social innovations. We chose the top 70 of those. So what criteria did we use to select those projects? And what's the range of options for funding and manufacturing and distribution that we've been developing? We explored those questions and more with hundreds of people from our Thrive Together network. It was a great conversation. Here's an excerpt from our team member, Goa Lobau, describing a little bit about open source and 3D printing, which are both great and important options for getting free energy out into the world without waiting for the cabal to think it's a good idea. Check it out. You know, the first, I think, most common misconception about open source is that you just kind of have to give it away and you've relinquished your rights or, or privilege or even opportunity for, you know, income from that. And, um, you know, really is not that at all. Uh, it's not necessarily a business model per se to do open source, but it's really a business strategy or a tactic um, so let me drop in a, um, a couple of quick links in the chat that have a few articles about this. One's from the Harvard Business Review and one's from uh, Open Health News. And the one with Open Health News is actually quite interesting because it goes into uh, 15 or 20 different distinct and the, kind of the most common types of uh, licensing strategies that you can use for open source. And they really range, you know, I'm not going to go through them all, but they're, you know, the most simple are something like a, a a dual license where you give it away for free to the user, uh, but anyone that wants to use it in a commercial application uh, needs to license it from the uh, proprietor. And Rob, I think, can speak more about that because he actually has done that himself. Um, we did the same type of strategy for the uh, toolkit that we developed for uh, the Thrive Visual Effects. We open sourced that last year in the same kind of a dual license uh, scenario. Um, but you know the real heart of the open source and the the, the piece that so it makes it so valuable is that you push a lot of very expensive aspects um, out towards the community. You know it can be a really expensive endeavor to uh, do Q and A on a product or a service or, or a piece of software. But when you know you you don't have to hire a hundred people, but you know a thousand people out in the community can do that independently and still have that feedback loop. It really can uh, race development along. It also proves and vets and improves the technology as you go. Uh, it you know closes up security holes. Um, you know the security aspect is, uh, aspect is is another important one because you know from a certain perspective, uh, commercial companies are disincentivized to actually you know be really tight with their security and you know it reveal that they've have holes or anything like that. Whereas in an open source paradigm. Uh, when you've got a community of people that are out there really trying to tear it down and make sure it's totally bulletproof and you know holds its water, um, those types of projects actually stack up much higher from a security and safety perspective than many uh, similar commercial products. So I think that's important to note. Um, most people uh, are, that are familiar with open source projects are usually on the software side because that's really where it's been developed and m most been most popularized. I think Linux, the operating system of Linux is a great example of that. And it's also a great example of where people are selling uh, add-on services or um, uh, you know, different types of services, be it um, you know, upgrades or add-ons like I mentioned, or even just customer support, you know, technical support for something like that, that's an add-on service, uh, while they're still giving away the core software as an open source package. Uh, Red Hat for, is an example of that for Linux. Um, but hardware really isn't excluded. There's some fantastic open source hardware projects. Arduino is one of my favorite examples uh, that's really leveraged the uh, proliferation of and the expansion of uh, 3D printing in the last several years. Um, and also many of you may also know of Tesla Motors uh, kind of did a quasi open source. They, they uh, told everyone that they're not going to enforce any infringements on their patents. So they've, so they've kind of open sourced their patents and said, okay, we're not going to, you know, go ahead and use them, and we won't, we won't sue, sue you for it. So it's, I think it's an excellent move in the right direction, but it wasn't quite a full-on open source uh, kind of a thing. Um, there's one other uh, link I want to drop into the chat, which is the uh, a new book by a fellow named um, Robert David Steele, and the book is called uh, Open Source Everything. And I just actually am starting this book. I haven't finished it yet, but uh, it raised some really popular ideas 
about uh, you know the theory of open source and really the uh, benefit that can be had by open sourcing literally everything. Well, 3D printing is essentially a way to take a digital file and make it into a physical object. And so um, here's, I've got a few examples of that. Here's something that we generated um, with the toolkit that we de devised uh, or designed for the film Thrive. Uh, so the form is actually made in software. And then this model is digitally sliced into you know, hundreds of thousands of tiny little layers. And then uh, 3D printing is also called additive manufacturing. And what it does is it uses a print head to lay down one tiny layer at a time on top of the next. And so what you get at the end is a, is a physical model of your digital uh, design. So that's kind of it in the nutshell. But what I think is really interesting of why it's really become so popular in the last few years is because the patents expired. You know, most people think, oh, this is a brand new phenomenon. But, you know, I've been tracking 3D printing, you know, literally for 15 years. The patents just expired in those years, 20 to 25 years. So it's really been around for over a quarter of a decade. And it's because the patents expired and the leverage uh, or the, the coalescent, I'm sorry, the convergence of uh, other open source technologies uh, that really have enabled this huge proliferation of 3D printing uh, now. Yeah, and that's there, a you know, great the, point. Now there are, uh, probably dozens of, of different 3D printers that are also part of an open source uh, model.